All right, so this morning, we're going to have Galatians 5, 22 and 23 up on the screen, but I'm going to ask you uh, to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11 because I'm going to start there, but we're going to read Galatians 5 together uh, before we start into the sermon. Uh, I'm going to be, we're going to be on faith or faithfulness this morning. Uh, never mind what it says in the bulletin, I'm good for about one mistake a week, and uh, that's the mistake this week, so we'll read Galatians 5, 22 and 23 together, but I'm going to start in Hebrews 11, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, but we'll uh, read about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, so if you'll please stand. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you this morning, Lord, that we have your word. Lord, that we have your love letter to us. And I pray this morning that we hear what you have to say. Lord, I'm an unworthy vessel, but Lord, I pray that you use me to speak to everyone here. Lord, that, that they hear your voice, they hear your words, they hear your truth. Lord, it, it's nothing that I come up on my come up with on my own, but Lord, it's, it's, it's revelation that you've given me. And Lord, I pray that uh, uh, you will anoint the eyes, the hearts, the ears, the mind, Lord, that, that everyone here, including myself, receives what you would have us to receive, what you would have us to hear. Lord, it's in your Son's most precious, holy, wonderful name we pray. Amen. All right, so when faith is talked about in the Bible, uh, it can mean uh, there, there's several different aspects of the term faith. Uh, there's basically six different types of faith that the Bible may talk about. And just real quickly, I won't go into detail on them, but you have the doctrinal faith, which is basically our set of beliefs, the faith, the Christian faith, so to speak. You've got saving faith, the faith that you have when you become born again, believing on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You have justifying faith, indwelling faith, daily faith, you know, the daily dependence on God, and we will discuss that a little bit. And then you have the gift of faith, which is one of the spiritual gifts. And so we won't go into, you know, exclusive detail on all of them because the term faith as a fruit of the Spirit is, is, encompasses more than just one type of faith. So when we look at Hebrews Chapter 11, we know that this is talking about the hall of faith. We know that the people here, it talks about that they had faith in God, and so they did something. But we look at verse 1 in chapter 11, this kind of gives us a definition of faith. And now I've preached on faith quite a bit uh, from this pulpit, and, and it needs to be because there's, there's so much things to faith. But how, when we look at verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. And so it's saying our faith is what the things that we hope for are composed of. Okay, we're hoping, we're counting on Jesus Christ coming again. That is our faith. Our faith is what composes that belief. And it says the evidence of things not seen. Okay, we don't particularly see God. Okay, we see the evidence of Him. Okay, we see the creation around us, but our faith is also supposed to be evidence of God. People should be able to look at us and say that there is a God. You know, not just looking at our DNA and our anatomy and the, and the way the body works, but the way we live, the way we act, our faith, how, how we respond to what we believe. You know, that we are evidence of those invisible things. We are evidence of God. He says the elders obtained a good report. They didn't get, obtain a good report just by believing in God. Okay? There's a lot of people that believe in God. You know, and it is written in the Bible that even the demons believe in the name of Jesus Christ and they tremble. They believe, but they were not born again. They were not saved. They did not have a faith that had legs to it. They did not have a faith really that meant anything. So we're not talking about a general belief. Faith is so much more than that. And then we look at verse 3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
And the key word I want to show you in verse 3 is understand. Okay, when you understand something, it means you have a good knowledge of that subject. Okay, there's, there's a lot of people that look at that and say, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Well, with the way that science is today, there's a lot of people that say, well, I just believe that God created the heavens and the earth. And, and that's, a blind, that's a blind faith in a sense. Uh, and, and sometimes people are ignorant to looking at the scientific data or what. But we've got to understand, it's not just that we believe that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And it wasn't millions of years ago. It's not just a blind belief. But we understand that we truly know. We truly understand. We know about some of the facts behind it. It's not just because the Bible tells me so, which that, that accounts for a lot. Okay? I know Jesus loves me because my Bible tells me so. That, that's all I need. But it says we understand. Okay? That means we know. We have a good working knowledge that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. God spoke, and there was the worlds. Okay, this is, this is not an ignorant faith. This is, not a, this is not something, like I said, that we just we believe in spite of evidence. Because if you truly look at evidence, and I may implore you to do that, if you, want to, if you really want to look at the evidence, whether the world was created or this hogwash that gets taught in our schools called evolution, if you look at the evidence, you will understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God and that we were created by the Word of God. Now, and then we look at verse 6 in Hebrews 11, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. That's not just talking about believing. Okay, that's going further than that. It says, For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Okay, first you believe, and then you're seeking after Him. I, I, I use this verse a lot, but Paul says, I'm, I'm following after Jesus Christ, so I can t attain the mark of the, the high calling of Jesus Christ. And so, faith, that is the fruit of the Spirit, is not just belief. Okay, there's churches filled every Sunday with people that just simply believe in God. But there's more than that. Okay, this kind of faith which is put on show here in Hebrews 11 where it talks about Abraham, it talks about Noah, it talks about Moses, it talks about even goes into David and Samson and, and even some other ones. Some other, and it says we, we even regret we can't talk about these because we can't fill up a whole book with all the faith of, of our forefathers. But Hebrews 11, that, this kind of faith which is put on show here, it's faith with legs to it. It's faith with fruit. It's faith with some meat and some substance to it. And like I said, this kind of faith is not just what we believe, it's what we do, and it's how we act based on what we believe. Okay? It's not just simple belief. Simple belief will get you absolutely nowhere. Okay? It, it may get you born again, but it will not get you to where you're a true disciple. It will not get you sanctified here on earth. You know, I say all the time, look, we become born again, we get eternal life, but our eternal life starts then. Okay, we don't just become born again so we can spend eternity in heaven. There's a lot of things that God wants to do through us and with our faith here on earth before we have to die. Okay, so I implore us to not be useless until we die. Okay, because there's a lot of Christians that are like that. But we know that we see in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, it's a faith that is moving. You're walking by faith. You're going somewhere in it. Okay, this is where we live. It's why we live. It's how we live. Okay, when we look at Romans 1, 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, you cannot just live by just belief. There has to be something to it. Okay, it, it, was, it was spiritual truth, scriptural truth like this that sparked the Reformation, okay? And, and, and I'm not going into great detail, but people like Martin Luther revealed that, hey, we are saved by faith. 
We're not saved by going through all these traditions and this, that, and other. We're saved by faith, and that inspires us to do more for God. Okay, the Reformation is the reason that we're not attending Catholic Mass this morning. Okay, at that, and, and I've talked about that before, so I'm going to leave that alone. But it's a popular notion today that faith is personal. And, and to a point, it is. Okay, you have a personal relationship with God. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of Christians that they just prefer to keep their faith to themselves. Okay, because for one, the world would have you to do that. A lot of times the, the world doesn't care what you do it in your house or it doesn't care what you do in the church building. They basically say you can have your faith, but I don't want to see it, I don't want to feel it, and I don't want to see you act on it. That's a bunch of hogwash because we fall and we give in to that notion in society. Okay? We, 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 we look at, well, it's just what I believe, and that's, what's, that's what my truth is. And God has, ne you never see in the Bible that God or Jesus Christ or Paul or anybody who wrote any book in the Bible instructs us to keep your faith to yourself. Never. And so, and we see the phrases by people like Paul, you know, he says, you know, shall I continue in sin so that grace may abound? And he says, certainly not. Okay? And that's an emphatic certainly not. And so, you know, if Paul were maybe writing part of the New Testament today, you know, he, he might would say a statement like, shall we keep our faith to ourselves as not to offend the world? Certainly not. Okay, our faith has to have some substance to it. And so we must remember that the fruits of the Spirit are not for our benefit. Okay, we talked about this in Galatians. The lust of the flesh, it always benefits us. Okay, it's what we want. But when we look at the fruits of the Spirit... That's characteristics, that's, that's the way we act, that yes, it will benefit us, but more than anything, it gives glory to God and it benefits other people. So our faith should be something that people can see. Our faith should be something that people benefit from. And so faith in this context denotes being faithful or having the characteristic of faithfulness. Okay, because a lot of times when we look at faith, we simply just call it belief. But, you know, this same word, this Greek word that's used for faith, it, it's pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. It's used for faith in places, it's used for faithfulness, it's used for faithful in, in its various forms. And so a person walking in the Spirit shows faith as a fruit. That one is a belief but it's a belief that spawns actions and attitudes that show integrity, honesty, fidelity, loyalty, trustfulness, and dependence. In short, this faith, okay, it starts with belief. Okay, you have to start with belief. I don't want to cheapen believing in God and believing in the gospel. You have to have that. But if you're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, that should be assumed, right? Because if you're born again, you're showing the fruit of the Spirit. You believe in God. You believe in the gospel. Okay, so it denotes our belief in God and His actions through Jesus Christ. But then that faith or faithfulness or being faithful shows, one, our dependence on God. And then it shows, two, that we can de be dependent on, one, by God, to carry out His commandments, to do the things He has called us to do, and two, that we can be dependent on by each other, by our brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, Matthew 23, 23 may put this into a little bit of perspective. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. They're not talking about that they left out believing in God when they use when they say that you have not been showing faith. Okay, because it you know we could assume the Pharisees believed in God. But faith there they was not dependable to their brothers and sisters. They was not faithful. They could not be depended on by the people who needed things by the people who needed shepherding in the land of Israel. 
They couldn't be dependent on by the poor who needed, you know, just the, the daily essentials that they did not have. They could not be depended on for that. So that's where they did not show faith. And so some quick things about being faithful or faithfulness as a fruit, for one, it's not temporary. Okay, there's no time limit. Let me use this example. If a couple is married and if they go for 20 years, they're married and, and, and they're happy and one decides to commit adultery, they cheat on their spouse, they may have you know, looked apart for 20 years, but you cannot say they were faithful because it didn't last. You know, a faithful spouse will always be faithful. Okay, it, it's permanent. It's, te it's not temporary. Okay, it, there, uh, Paul uses the phrase a lot of times in his letters to Timothy. He says, this is a faithful saying. Okay, when he's using this word faithful, he means you can stand on this saying. You know, a couple of those sayings, he says, if I die with Jesus Christ, then I will live with Jesus Christ. Okay, that is a faithful saying. That's permanent. That will stand the test of time. Another one he said is, this is a faithful saying that Christ came to save sinners, which I am chief. That is something that will never change. The truth to that statement will never change. That Jesus Christ died for sinners. Okay, and so faithful also means it doesn't matter what the circumstances are that you are faithful. We look at Revelation 2.10. Jesus is speaking to one of the churches. He says, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He's not saying just believe unto death. He's saying you believe and you still carry out the commandments that I have unto death. You're going to suffer. You're going to go through tribulations. That stuff does not matter. He's saying be faithful unto death. The only time you don't have to be faithful no more is when you're not breathing anymore, and by then you're not worried about it because you're in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will eternally be faithful to him regardless. And then it's regardless of your resources. Okay, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Okay? Let you read a little bit here. Matthew 25. When I saw this and, and understood this, I, 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 was very, I was blessed by it. Okay? And I think we all need to hear this. Matthew 25, verses 20 through 23. Okay, a little background. Jesus is telling the parable of the landowner who leaves for a while and then he comes back and he had distributed talents and he, he's calling to account what they did with those talents. So in verse 20, in Matthew 25, he says, And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. He doubled what he had with the resources he had. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He had five talents, and Jesus Christ told him he was a faithful servant because he doubled those talents. And so then we look at verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And so he only had two talents, but he doubled them. And Jesus said he was faithful. He was a good and faithful servant. So it didn't matter what resources they had. It was dependent on what they did, what those resources Okay, and when we are faithful with the resources we have, He will give us more resources to be faithful with. Okay, there's, there's churches, there's ministries that may have more money than we do. Okay, well, there ain't no may to it, there is. But we are called to be faithful with what we have, with what God has given us. Okay, whether it be our material possessions, whether it be our life, we are called to be good stewards. We are called to be faithful in that. Whether we have two talents or whether we have five. And we may just have one talent, but what we are certainly not to do is go and bury it and hide it. 
So faith absolutely has to start with belief in the gospel, but faith without fellowship becomes empty belief. Okay? We have that faith. We are to fellowship with God the Father through the Holy Spirit. Okay? We are to fellowship with each other. Because our faith without fellowship with one another and fellowship with God, it becomes empty belief. It's not a faith that has legs. Why was the apostles' faith so strong? Because they fellowshiped with Jesus Christ for three years. Or some of them fellowshiped with Him for 40 days after He was resurrected. Okay, that made their faith strong. Okay, they, didn't, they wasn't indwelled with the Holy Spirit until after Pentecost. We have that. When we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit. We can fellowship with Him every day. We are called to pray and talk to our God. We are called to study to show ourselves approved. We are, this all strengthens our fellowship. Okay, That's, that, that is our dependence on God. You know, taking things to Him in prayer. Realizing that we can't know the truth of God in and of ourselves, but we have to study the truth of God as revealed in Scripture, as revealed by the Holy Spirit. Obeying the commandments that we know and understand. We know a lot of God's commandments, what He has told us to do in our life, but a lot of times we ignore them. It's not rocket science. Okay, We have commandments in the Bible. And, and if, if, God, if Jesus tells us to do something, that means that's a commandment do it. You know, Paul, when he writes that we are to be not anxious over anything, that is a command to not worry. I, I mentioned that a few weeks ago. So our faith strengthens as we fellowship with the Spirit and as we walk in the Spirit and as we depend on God and, and as we know that what God has promised to us is true. You know, and, and three of the Gospels uh, uh, have where Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, jump. Or, if, you know, you can command this mountain to move. And it will move by your faith. That's something that God, that Jesus Christ has promised to us, and that means it's true. We can count on that, but we don't live like we believe that we can have mountain moving faith. Or that we can be healed just by our faith. There's many healings in the Bible that Jesus says, Go your way, your faith has healed thee. You know, we can... We can believe that God's promises is true and that we can do those things with our faith. We look in, uh, when, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he exhorts Timothy, he says, go find faithful men and teach them the things so they can teach. Okay? Faithful men. When he's talking about leadership in the church, the elders, the bishops, whatever you want to call them. A lot of them's the same Greek name, but the English translation is different. But... Says they're wise, must be found faithful in all things. Okay? That's any leadership in the church. You know, we're we are called that we are told that we are stewards of the mysteries of God. And those stewards shall be found faithful. That's in First Corinthians. Okay? That's us. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. We if we have the Holy Spirit, we have a and inside track on a lot of things that the world doesn't understand. And we're stewards of those mysteries. I've talked before how we're stewards of the gospel. We've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and we are to be good stewards of that. And well, what, what is being good stewards of that? We're bringing other people into that so they'll know, so they'll understand, so they'll be stewards of the mysteries of God. You know, this is all being dependent upon God. You know, this is part of being faithful. You know, a, a faithful servant, they're dependent on their master and they do the things their master requires of them. Second Kings 19.14, and this is, this is something, when I read this, I thought this was awesome. I want, you to, I want you to hang with me and stay with me. I know we're past 12 and we still got some things to do, but I, I, I need you to understand. And in Second Kings 19, this is when Sennacherib has his army uh, besieging Jerusalem. King Hezekiah is the king, and, and, and his... Uh, his, I guess, general or whatever you want to call him, he goes and he says, who is y'all's God to keep us from taking over this city? He's not going to keep us from taking over. He said, look at these other cities. Their gods didn't help him. And so he, there was a letter written, and it comes to King Hezekiah, and it says in 1914, in 2 Kings, it says, and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and he spread it before the Lord. So, and, and this is what I find neat. Okay, he gets this letter, this threatening letter, that they're, they're going to be taken over, that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, they've already taken Israel. 
Okay, and they're going to come and get Judah. Hezekiah, he takes this letter and he goes to the temple of God and he spreads it out before God. He said, God, you see this? He says, there's not much I can do about it. But however, you can. He says, I can't do nothing about this by myself. He said, this is something bigger than what I can handle. And so he takes that letter, he takes that bad news and he spreads it out before God. He says, God, you handle it. I can't. And there's a lot of things in our life that we just cannot handle until we spread it out before God. You know, when we see what he did here, let me read this to you. He said, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth that has made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thy ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. He says, look at this, Lord. He says, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't do nothing about this. But I know you can hear. You read it. You hear what he said. And you lead us to take care of it. Judah didn't fall that day. Amen. And when a person is faithful to God in this way, when he has his dependence on God, and he's walking in the Spirit, he's living in the Spirit, he becomes faithful to his brothers and sisters. Okay? They can be depended on. Book of 3 John, verse 5 and 6, says, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to the strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. We are to be faithful to one another in that you ought to be able to depend on me and I ought to be able to depend on you. Okay, that's being faithful. That's having that faithfulness. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If you tell me you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And we are here to help each other. You know, when, when I asked Levi, Bart, and Hank the questions, it said, are you going to be faithful to the ministry of this church, to attend worship, to, to take part in the ministry and do these things? And they said, yes. And you know what? It's up to us. We hold each other accountable. That's being faithful to each other. You know, that is what we have to do. You know, being faithful is more than a one-day-a-week commitment. I know you probably get tired of me saying it. Good. It's more than that. You know, now, we need to, we need to meet with each other, and it don't always have to be here. But I can tell you, my best friends are in this church. You know, and, and I want to be faithful to them, and I want them to be faithful to me. You know, we have, we have missionaries we support. Okay? We are supporting them monthly to show ourselves faithful to them and to their ministry and the work that they're doing. They can depend on us every month to support them. That is being faithful. That people can depend on us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to do the work that we've been called to do. And so when we look at any relationship, what is the best way to ensure that the other party is faithful to you? It's to be faithful yourself. That is why we are to be faithful to God and faithful to each other because God was faithful to us. We look at Romans 5.8. And this, you know, this ought to really speak to every one of us. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was faithful to us even when we was not faithful to him. He rose again because he was faithful. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us, and I can tell you he didn't have to do any of it. But he was faithful. That should be enough right there for us to be faithful to Him. But as I close, Galatians 2.20, which Melinda read this earlier. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. 
He told his apostles there's not a greater love that a man can have than to die for his friends. All right? He showed that they could depend on him because he was faithful to them. And then we see, especially with the apostles, what they were able to do. Okay? That was 11 people. They added a 12th in the book of Acts in Matthias. But 11 people did a great many things. We got almost four times out here this morning. So as uh, David and Cheryl comes up for the invitation, and when we get done with the invitation, we'll take part of the Lord's Supper in, again in a way that shows us how God is faithful. So this morning, if you have not been faithful to God, if you, if you don't even have that, just that initial faith, you can come and pray about that. Somebody will pray with you. Whatever... Whatever it is you need, okay, we're here to be faithful to one another, okay, so people can depend on us. When we say that we're going to pray for somebody and people ask us to pray for them, they can know that we're faithful and they can depend on us to do that. Let us stand and sing.